since 1922. Unidas, an open access journal, is the oldest extant multidisciplinary journal in the Philippines. In 1922, the University of Santo Tomas main building was constructed. Considered as one of historical symbols in UST that also represented the height of civilizational achievement in the Philippines. The main building was not born by itself in the year 1922. The academic journal Unitas was founded in the same year. Through the years, Unitas has been witness to the nation's history same as its twin, the main building which would be known as the heart of the university. During the so-called peacetime of the interwar years, UNITAS has the courage to speak about the urgent issues of the day, as well as from the state-of-the-art in fine scholarly theorizing in the arts and published scholarly articles included on the incubation period of the infection typhoid, a series of articles on the indigenous church, problems of working class legislation in the Philippines, the socialistic dream, the fine arts and aesthetic pleasure, the Philippines woman and her influence in the future. During the early American period, The same year when UNITAS broke into academic publication scene, three other journals came into limelight. The Philippine Journal of Science, established in 1906 by the American government, had its interest in scientific research only. The Philippine Agriculturalist and Forester, established in 1911 by UP Los Paños, was founded by the student body of the College of Agriculture and Forestry. The University of the Philippines and its Los Baños branch was similar to college student publication until it developed as an academic journal publication for Philippine agricultural scientists. The Philippine Law Journal, established in 1914 by UP College of Law, was founded by the student-run Law Review affiliated in UP Diliman. The publication was designed as a vital training tool for law students and modeled after the student-edited law reviews of American law school. In the late 1940s, shortly after World War II, while USD served as an internment camp, UNITAS continued in the publication of research and journals, not only about the relevant disciplines, but also on Filipino society, the nation, and in the world. Various multidisciplinary publications were held in UNITAS. Some of its examples are in the fields of economics, architecture, an international research series from Indonesia, the Middle East, and India. Today, UNITAS has expanded its arena to scholarly international conferences and publications, not just through traditional publication, but also shifted to open access online journals. UNITAS will celebrate its centenary in 2022. Looking into the rich history of the journal itself has been made possible by the USD Heritage Library Collections, which has painstakingly scanned all copies of UNITAS starting from its very first issue published in July 1922. This was done for the preservation and digitalization of the journals and for the convenient perusal of specialists, scholars, and general readers. As the oldest university-based multidisciplinary journal of its kind in the Philippines and possibly in Asia, UNITAS is a rich source of information and insights in understanding various aspects of the history of knowledge production 
in the Philippines across the disciplines. UNITAS is an international online peer-reviewed open access journal of advanced research in literature, culture, and society. Published biannually, May and November, by the University of Santo Tomas. Good afternoon. This is May Sevilla Perez, your host, and welcome to the final installment of the International Lecture Series of UNITAS. Before we start, please be reminded of the following guidelines. First, kindly make sure that you have registered for this lecture. The registration link can be accessed below at the comments section. For your questions, comments, and insights, please feel free to post them as comments, and these will be read during the open forum. Second, do not forget to accomplish the post-conference evaluation form, which will be posted later at the comment section. Only those who have registered and have accomplished the evaluation form are entitled to receive a certificate. By way of opening remarks, we in UNITAS welcome you today for participating in the last of the series of international lectures billed as UNITAS 100, an advanced celebration of a century of publication of UNITAS, the journal. As may be gleaned from the introductory video, since the first issue of UNITAS in July 19, 2022, it has expanded the arena of its scholarly, even linguistic conversations with the rest of the world of scholarship. But the last several years of its publication might be just as worth bringing to our attention by way of perhaps another video one day. Under the journal's new initiatives and leadership, UNITAS has moved forward by leaps and bounds. It has transformed from a local, national to an international scholarly publication in the process modernizing its concept and format and upgrading it all around as an international journal. Such a transformation befits a journal with an especially long and distinguished history from which one can trace back exciting and illuminating vignettes of the intellectual history of a people. This transformation would not have been possible without the editorial support and scholarly advice of the still expanding International Editorial Board consisting of leading international scholars in their specific fields of specialization from Asia to the United States to Europe and Latin America. Neither would it have been realized without the administrative support and encouragement right from the outset of the USD Swector the Secretary General, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Letters, and the Chair and Faculty of the Literature Department in the last several years, but most especially its staff members who have come and gone advancing their young careers elsewhere. Still, with energies waxing and waning in the last several years through sheer overwork, we in USD know that there is no UNITAS as we know it now without the unwavering commitment and single-minded vision of the journal's new editor-in-chief, who has been the guiding light of UNITAS, and dynamic scholar-in-residence of USD based in the Faculty of Arts and Letters. Today, UNITAS is known worldwide through its issues, which are published online and open access, and its active membership in a national and international network of scholars and professional organizations through the initiative of the Editor-in-Chief. And wherever in the world she travels, she proudly carries the UNITAS banner as she had carried the banner of Ateneos Critica at Cultura in another life and continues to do so as KK's Editor Emerita. Under her leadership, the centennial year celebration in 2022 will be highlighted by several milestones, namely, one, the publication of the special centennial issue for which contributions will be exclusive to the members of the international board, two, the formal organization by UNITAS and a scholar in residence of the network of journals in Asia, which will be called the Asia Journals Network or AJN, 
whose founding members are the editors and staff members of academic journals from the Philippines, Indonesia, Japan, China, Korea, and Taiwan. And third, the digitalization of all UNITAS issues from 1922 to 2022, complete with abstracts and keywords, which will be our gift to the loyal readers worldwide by way of providing them the convenience of a scholar friendly archival research. You are all invited to all of these activities. To cap off UNITAS 100 International Lecture Series is this afternoon's lecture titled Reading ASEAN's Fictions of Community. The abstract reads, constituent instruments of international organizations constitute fictions of personality and community. With the ratification of the ASEAN Charter, ASEAN as an international organization now acts as an international person and presents itself as a community. This lecture examines these tropes of international organizations and critiques ASEAN's fictions of community through a reading of the language of community of its three organs the ASEAN Economic Community, the ASEAN Political Security Community, and the ASEAN Social Cultural Community. The lecture argues that ASEAN's notions of community reify objects in the economic realm, turn people into homo sector in the political sphere, and marginalize the cultural in what is supposed to be the domains of the social cultural. In conclusion, the lecture proposes a new way of seeing ASEAN and the region. By connecting the trope of work to the concept of the right to the region, the lecture offers a trope that allows a wider and permanent participation of Southeast Asian peoples in building their regional community. This afternoon's speaker is Jose Duke Bagulaya. He is a lawyer and author of three books, Writing Literary History, Mode of Economic Production, and 20th Century Warai Poetry, published by UP Press, Linara Nga Mga Pulong Mga Siday, Woven Words, Poems, also published by UP Press, and ASEAN as an International Organization, International Law and Region Building in Southeast Asia, published by USD Publishing House. As a lawyer, he has joined cost-oriented litigation in Manila, defending the Philippine Airlines Employees Association, Carlos Celdran, and Marawi petitioners against martial law in Mindanao Island, among others. His legal articles have appeared in leading international law journals, such as Cardozo School of Laws, Law and Literature, Asian Journal of Law and Society, Asian Journal of International Law, and Leiden Journal of International Law. He is a faculty member of the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Presently, he is writing a PhD dissertation on international law and literature at the Faculty of Law of the University of Hong Kong. Our respondent is attorney Rumel Regalado Bagares, who teaches international law in three Manila law schools and is on the faculty of the Department of International Law and Maritime Law of the Philippine Judicial Academy. He earned communication and law degrees from the University of the Philippines. He is working on a PhD in international legal theory in the external doctoral program of the VJ Université Amsterdam, where he had earlier earned a master's degree, cum laude. In 2019, his essay on direct effect of international law in domestic law was published as a chapter in the Oxford Handbook of International Law in Asia and the Pacific. 
He has forthcoming essays on customary international law and the Philippine National Territorial Imaginary with Cambridge University Press and the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, respectively. Without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome our esteemed speaker, attorney Jose Du Bagulaya. Hello, everyone. The title of my lecture is Reading and Sense Fictions of Community. I shall interrogate the discourse of community in ASEAN, which has been constitutionalized by the ASEAN Charter. I contextualize the discourse of community within international law, particularly international organizations law, and read its fictions through critical theory. I argue that constituent instruments of international organizations constitute fictions of personality and community with the ratification of the ASEAN Charter. ASEAN as an international organization now acts as an international person and presents itself as a community. I examine these tropes of international organizations and critique ASEAN's fictions of community through a reading of the language of community of its three organs, the ASEAN Economic Community, the ASEAN Political Security Community, and the ASEAN Social Cultural Community. I argue that ASEAN's notions of community reify objects in the economic realm, turn people into homo Saturn, the political sphere, and marginalize the cultural in what is supposed to be the domains of the social cultural. In conclusion, I propose a new way of seeing ASEAN and the region. By connecting the trope of work to the concept of the right to the region, I offer a trope that allows a wider and permanent participation of Southeast Asian peoples in building their regional community. An international organization for the constructivist generality is a bureaucratic entity with a headquarters and letterhead that is based on an institution. An institution in turn is a set of norms and rules that shape identity and regulate behaviors of actors. They can be formal or informal, depending on whether the norms and rules are codified in legal documents such as treaties and international agreements. These institutions may be in the form of regimes institutional practices or a constitution. As from this viewpoint, ASEAN is a bureaucratic entity with a headquarters in Indonesia, shaped and regulated by a formal institution called the ASEAN Charter, which may be considered its constitution. Of course, this does not mean that the ASEAN organization necessarily views itself as a cold bureaucracy. On the contrary, the organization views itself as a one community. With that as it may, this, this distinction between organization and institution is not always observed by international lawyers. The word institution has been used to describe international organizations as when one textbook calls the latter an international institution. For institutional lawyers, what is crucial is the distinction between international organizations and other forms of international cooperation. So they try, for instance, to underscore the difference between the informal G20 and the European Union, or between the informal BRICS and the post-2007 ASEAN. Legally, no treaty confers personality on the G20 and the BRICS, and unlike international organizations, they do not have a le separate legal personality and cannot act independently of their member states. For this discussion, one may know that what is critical in the formation of an international organization is a treaty. Legal definitions of an international organization include the element of treaty. As Jen Clavers defines it as an entity created by states on the basis of a treaty, endowed with an organ and a distinct will. It is a form of a cooperation founded on the basis of an international agreement and provided with at least one organ with a will of its own. This constituent treaty is not an ordinary instrument. Treaties constituting international organizations are of a particular type, for they create subjects of international law who are conferred with autonomy. By saying this, the International Court of Justice, or ICJ, did not mean that these subjects have the same powers, rights, and obligations possessed by states. Rather, it was saying that states are not alone in the international community. International organizations are also 
subjects with international rights and duties, capacity to pursue certain claims. In short, an international organization is an international person. Here, one confronts the most powerful trope in the field of international organizations, the person. The international institution is a person who exercises its belong to distinct force in the realm of international law. This means the person has a power to act, that is, enter into con contracts and sue, and so forth, independently of its creators. This trope is then extended to the parts of the organization which are now called organs. The institution, this person, is undoubtedly a traditional metaphor, but recent scholarly reflections have complicated this trope. Personality, it may be noted, is rooted in the Latin persona, which literally means mass. When a group of states form an international organization, they create a fictional person akin to wearing a mask. In this way, hiding behind the mask of personality helps create a theatrical role where the states turn public life into a spectacle where raw emotions and primal interests can be channeled and sublimated through the institution of a legal person. In other words, the metaphor of a person protects them as a group from outside interference, allowing them to conduct politics in a stylized form. It means that the audience can see through the some sort of dragon dance where they could get a glimpse of several men leaping in coordination and in a theatrical manner. States as actors therefore do not disappear from sight. They are merely behind a transparent and layered entity that is the international organization. Well, person was a traditional trope in international organization law. Community is a new trope that has recently become ubiquitous. Writing in the mid 90s in the last century, one legal scholar states the following words in an article lyrically titled The Souls of International Organizations. And I quote, while international lawyers continue to describe international institutions with a tired traditional metaphor of personality, the states that are members of those institutions, the people who staff and serve them, and the empirical and theatrical, theoretical scholars who study them have come to see them in terms of communities. While Bederman admits that the fictive person is still around, he recognizes that organizations see themselves as a legal embodiment of communities with complex interplays of equal and subordinate relations with states, with other organizations. The image of legal personality has not been the only metaphor used to describe international institutions and the regimes they make. Baderman's article is undoubtedly a lyrical celebration of international organizations and communities. He searches for a new way of seeing international organizations, and he finds it through the lens of the metaphor of community. For Baderman, a trope of community best describes states when they come together to construct regimes that may constrain their acts and other international actors' behavior. These treaty regimes create norms and do have a powerful law-creating effect. When an international organization facilitates the creation and ratification of treaties, it acts less as a person, but more like as a community. In these cases, the international legal regimes could be seen as, to borrow the words of Mahmer, the nearest approach to legislation by the whole community of states. Thus, the constituent treaty of an international organization creates fictions of a person and a community. Most recently, the trope of community has been so normalized that there's an urgent need to question and interrogate. Literary critic, cultural and cultural scholar Raymond Williams once wrote that the word community seems never to be used unfavorably. <clears throat> they, this, unlike the words state, nation, society, does not acquire any positive, opposing or distinguishing term. Indeed, it has been used to seduce many scholars, practitioners and scholars of international law have not been able to resist the seduction. Baderman's article discusses about this without doubt its most lyrical celebration. 
nonetheless, even the first and most important judicial decision in international organizations law already premised its international its determination of the existence of the UN legal personality, which the treaty failed to expressly grant on the idea that the nature and rights of legal subjects depend upon the needs of the community. The concept of community interests, which encompass fundamental values shared by a group of states or the international community as a whole, now stands as an important pillar of the international order. In the field of international relations, the recent revival of the idea of community and security communities has spawned numerous works, including a full length book on the construction of an ASEM security community. Scholars have in fact noted the shift from a discourse of region building to community building in official ASEM discourses. A discursive shift that certainly utilizes the positive and emotive connotations of community, which are lacking in the word region. And surprisingly, Southeast Asia, Asia's international institution would adopt the language of community by speaking of an ASEAN community, an ASEAN political security community, an ASEAN economic community, and an ASEAN social cultural community. Following this trend, more scholars have in turn embraced the rhetoric of community building or regional community. The term community is said to have become part of our way of understanding the world. This ordinariness, which makes it disarmingly acceptable to the ear, is further complicated by its meaning that may refer either to a group of people, a quality of relationship, or a location. The slippery character of the term allows people to evoke the more positive connotations of community such as harmony, homogeneity, autonomy, immediacy, morality, locality, solidarity, and identity. Gerald Fried writes that the success of modern rule owes much to its articulation of an expansive authority in the language of community. Modern states traffic in the emotional elements of community to establish consent. Thus, we do not resist community policing since we are disarmed by the first word in a way that makes sec the second word more acceptable. Second, Miranda Joseph offers sovereign view of community that uncovers not only its inclusions and exclusions, but also its connections to capital. She argues that community supplements capital and shores it up and facilitates the flow of capital. This is quite clear in the relationship between consumption and community. Capital nowadays is producing or targeted communities of race, gender, and nationality. Thus, the degree to which consumption practices correlates to the boundaries of communities is not coincidental. This critical view of community cannot be limited to the confines of a single state. The proliferation of communities in the form of international organizations, the former U European community, now the EU, the Indian community, now the ASEAN community, demands a critical examination of this cooptation at the international level. The critique then must be taken to the regional level where states are involved in a so-called community building. I now turn to ASEAN's language of community. The ASEAN Charter constituted an international organization that uses both the tropes of person and community. In fact, Article 3, Chapter 2 states that ASEAN as an intergovernmental organization is hereby conferred legal personality. Although I focus here on the trope of community, it is important not to ignore the fiction of a person in ASEAN. The metaphor of a person is constitutionalized by the Charter and the ideas of a community, as I will later argue, are all materialized in organs and given flesh by bodies. Both organs and bodies are without doubt extensions of the, meta, uh, the person metaphor. That is why one needs to keep this metaphor in mind. As in first use the language of community in the 1976 declaration of the ASEAN Concord. It says member states shall vigorously develop an awareness of regional identity and exert all efforts to create a strong ASEAN community. 
but as one scholar rightly points out, this was little more than a political slogan. This scholar argues that it was only after the 2003 declaration of the ASEAN conference that the creation of an ASEAN community became a concrete plan. Nonetheless, if seen from the viewpoint of institutional law, the turning point would be <clears throat> the ratification of the ASEAN Charter. As already mentioned in the previous section, <clears throat> the, Constitution, the Constituent Treaty creates not only a fiction of personality, but also a fiction of community. The Charter indeed speaks the language of community. The word permits the Charter from its preamble and purposes to the chapter enumerating its organs. There's a preamble using the fiction of the peoples of Southeast Asia's authors states that the creators are convinced to realize an ASEAN community. One of the purposes of the organization is to develop human resources for the empowerment of the peoples of ASEAN and for the strengthening of the ASEAN community. The organization further intends to promote a people-oriented ASEAN in which all sectors of ASEAN are encouraged to participate and benefit from the process of ASEAN integration and community building. One must, however, ask the charter how the charter itself materializes this community. By materialize, what is meant is how the idea is transformed into an organizational structure. As I turn to chapter four of the charter, which creates the organs of the person. Article nine creates the ASEAN community councils, which include the three pillars, the ASEAN political security community, the ASEAN economic community, and the ASEAN social cultural community. They are all councils. <clears throat> It is notable how these organizational structures use both the tropes of person and community, in which each council is both an organ and a community. Legally, an organ is subordinate to the person of the organization. Often, it does not have a personality of its own. The organs of an international organization, however, are important in the same way that an organ is critical to a person. It is through the organs that an international organization performs functions and achieves its objectives. Organs are also given the power to interpret the rules of an organization. Most importantly, through the analysis of its organs, one may understand the organization since the organs form part of the latter's interior design. Thus, the materialization of an idea of a community into an organ and how the same organ in turn expresses a vision of community is worth examining. I turn to the ASEAN um, economic community. The nomenclature of economic community reminds one of the European economic community of the 50s. And many terms such as single market and free flow seem to suggest a repeat of the European model. But it is common knowledge among scholars that ASEAN is not an imitation of the EU. Although both EU and ASEAN are international organizations, the member states of the latter institution have not given up certain competencies and as a treaty signed by ASEAN alone cannot have a direct effect on the domestic law of the member states. Exclusive competence, limitations of sovereignty of member states and direct effects are strictly principles of European law. And we must be very careful since the AEC does not use the terms with the same reference. What kind of economic community does this organ construct? The vision is constitutional, it's in Article 1, 5, Chapter 1 of the Charter. It says, to create a single market and production base, which is stable, prosperous, highly competitive, and economically integrated with effective facilitation for trade and investment, in which there is a free flow of goods, services, and investment, facilitated movement of person but business persons, professionals, talents, and labor, freer flow of capital. This vision of a community is conceptually rich if the glittering generalities of stable, prosperous, highly competitive are drunk. It is, however, a vision torn between aspiration and conservatism, between free market imaginaries and statist control. 
between the future and the present. The final answer is a vision of a community where things are more powerful than people and freedom belongs to things. Chuck Beltman's has written a full-length book on economic concepts in the Asset Charter and has evaluated Asset's idea of integration from the viewpoint of a modern stages approach to economic integration. I end up here as conceptualizations and add the critical lenses of reification and fetishism. He knows that the single market is more of an aspiration than a regulatory concept, but even the European Union has achieved a single market. Moreover, the concept of a single market could not accommodate the distinction between a free flow of goods and a freer flow of capital. Freer flow of capital, in fact, contradicts a single market. More importantly, for the people of the region, the vision is selective for focusing on a skilled labor, which was changed to professionals in the chart. Unlike the flow of goods, which has now treated to govern it, and skilled laborers have been left out in the code as there is no treaty covering them. But whether skilled or not, there are no rights for people to access labor markets in the ASEAN community. Only the states retain the right to facilitate the movement of business persons, who, as the human embodiment of capital, seem to always come first, followed by professionals, talents, and last, and perhaps the least labor. The words free and freer are conferred not on human beings, but on things such as goods and capital. In the final analysis, the freest of them all are only the creations of human beings, the reified goods. I turn to the ASEAN political security community. I shall uh, examine this um, ASEAN political security community from the viewpoint of critical security studies. Ken Booth writes, security means the absence of threats, emancipation is the freeing of people from physical and human constraints, which stop them from carrying out what they would freely choose to do. War and the threat of war is one of those constraints, together with poverty, poor education, political oppression, and so on. Security and emancipation are two sides of the same point. Emancipation, not power or order, produces security. Emancipation, theoretically, is security. Against this concept of security, I shall turn to examine Assen's political security organ. Several bodies come under the APSC, such as the Assen Foreign Minister's Meeting, Defense Minister's Meeting, Law Minister's Meeting, the Assen Regional Forum. Of the three organs, this is the most homogeneous. One, Walter Wood, for instance, describes the membership of the ASC as a mixed bag and the ASEAN Social Cultural Committee as miscellaneous. This membership of the APSC tells us something about the limits of the concept of security in the chart, which is legal, military centric. Writing 10 years after the signing of the charter, Scholar pointed out that. The major shortcomings of the organ were in the promotion of human rights and cooperation for good governance. This is already ex expected from the state-centric concept of security in ASEAN, as materialized in the APSC organ and the ministerial bodies under it. The organ's composition may be considered the materialization of the idea of security in ASEAN. It may be noted that the predominant formulations of security in ASEAN have been the concepts of comprehensive security and regional resilience. Comprehensive security refers to a formulation of security that goes beyond military threats and covers political, economic, and sociocultural dimensions. Regional resilience underscores economic development, neutrality, and great power competitions. Both of them have already been criticized as state-centric and rather limited. This state centricity in ideas and in their materialization in the APSC may be the reason why multilateral cooperation in this area has been, has been reduced to an exclusive soiree of regional officials and bureaucrats, not state actors, and other representatives of peoples and communities threatened by climate change, forced migration, and state violence, 
are not invited. They do not partake in the usual regional banquets organized by ASEAN. In fact, even the APSC Blueprint 2025, which includes non-traditional security issues, remains police-centric. Under the non-traditional security, the Blueprint lists transnational crimes, terrorism, drugs, human trafficking, armed smuggling, cyber crime. All these issues are certainly important, but they remain police-related work, except perhaps disaster management. Measured against the concept of critical security formulated above, the non-traditional security issues almost look old hat. Published in 26 in the APSC Blueprint 2025, proclaimed a rules-based, people-oriented, people-centered community where peoples enjoy human rights and fundamental freedoms as its vision. To implement this vision, the Philippine state marched ahead and launched its drug war titled Operation to Come that victimized thousands of so-called drag pushers and addicts. Not to be outdone, the Myanmar military also continued its genocidal war against the Rohingya people, pushing the latter to neighboring Bangladesh or to the sea if they are lucky enough to the shores of other ASEAN countries. In response, the International Court of Justice issued provisional measures in, case, in the case of Gambia versus Myanmar, ordering the Republic of the Union of Myanmar to take all measures to prevent the commission of acts enumerated in Article 2 of the Genocide Convention. It took a non ASEAN state to plead before the international courts to stop Myanmar from faithfully executing its version of a rule based, people oriented, and people centered community. Indeed, in the ASEAN community, people find themselves rightless when member states deem them to be outside the national law. Member states cannot guarantee the human rights of peoples living within the region. Thus, the moment the people of a Southeast Asian state lose the protection of their government, no authority, to borrow Hannah Arendt's words, is left to protect them and no institution is willing to guarantee them within the region. I turn to the ASEAN social cultural community. The ASEAN social cultural community appears to the imagination as a crowded house. The bodies under this organ are both numerous and miscellaneous. They include ministers and officials of education, culture, information, environment, health, labor, rural development, social welfare, youth, civil service, disaster, meteorology, and the university network. The ASCC carves a domain that includes human development, social welfare and protection, social justice and rights, environmental sustainability, as an identity, the narrowing of the develop, development gap. One ASEAN consultant describes the ideas behind it. The ASCC is a soft side of development or sectoral cooperation, conflated with technical cooperation among developing countries. Social cultural cooperation grew out of ideas of functionalism, neo functionalism. This dimension of regionalism was given the official name, functional cooperation in 1987 on the wave of the sustainable development movement. Its scope of work was expanded and then labeled social cultural cooperation in 2004. That's how it's described by one um, consultant of the ASEAN. This characterization of the organ as a soft side of development cooperation reveals the present nature of the ASCC. It aims to cover what was sidelined by the elitist and exclusionary APSC and ASC. Moreover, the ASC privileges the business persons and the APSC, the governing class, the lawyers, the generals, such both leave out the people, that is in its Ramsarian sense, those who do not count, those who do not have qualifications to partake in archy or governing. This is the reason why the, the ASCC has practically gathered those ministers concerned with the laborers and their education. Arguably, the idea behind the organ is to remedial in nature, to remedy was its function. This function is still very much clear in its objective of providing livelihood to people. Though this is now couched in the language of human development, which combines the insights of the basic needs approach and sense concept of capability building. 
Nonetheless, by adopting the language of development studies, the organ also assumes the function of capital's social worker that is tending the beggars produced by the international economic system without questioning the whole logic and infrastructure of such system. This is the logic of the division between economic community and social cultural community. Former establishes an unquestionable economic arrangement the latter serves as its social welfare subordinate, if not its utility man. While it tries to move beyond the economic growth centered notion of development, as its main problem remains the economic welfare of the losers within the system. However, through a new social cultural nomenclature, the economic, the proximate cause of the problem disappears and becomes an absent cause as it assumes a spectral presence in the concerns of the organ. In this way, the mode of production that produces unemployment, underemployment, illiteracy, high mortality, inequality, and environmental damage is nowhere to be seen, and yet very much remains a palpable presence within the sociocultural sphere. Capital, it seems, has wrapped itself with a veil, haunting the sociocultural community. If the economic is absent with a spectral presence, the cultural is marginally present with a spectral absence. This is ASCC style of exclusion by inclusion. When Nasser started wearing the cloth of sociocultural cooperation, one may think that the cultural would become predominant. This new attire certainly has attracted some confused stares by bystanders. One of the source of the confusion is the prominence of culture in satire. Of course, the word culture is one of the most complex words in the English language, but one of its more common associations to literature, art, and other civilizational artifacts. International relations theorists accommodate the concept, define it as the values, customs, beliefs, and symbolic practices by which men and women live. It refers to a people's way of life that includes poetry, music, and dance, including the kind of transport network they have built. It's based on Eagleton's definition. To reiterate, the confusion lies in the thinking that the cultural would be prominent in the programs of the organ. One study, for example, finds that young people in Asen think of integration in terms of network and culture. Studies authors therefore recommend the SCC focus on networking culture. The first ASCC blueprint, however, relegated culture, which includes the purpose preservation of cultural heritage and creative production to letter E of the plan. It was preceded by numerous development goals and then followed by projects resolving the development gap in Nassim. This poor and marginal position is matched by substantive insignificance. This official marginalization spills over into semi-official works. Symptomatic of this marginalization of culture in the ASCC is the representativeness of the book on the ASCC that included the study of Levi Roth and his colleagues Volume 4 of Asen at 50, which was published by the Economic Research Institute of Forest Asen and East Asia, compiled articles on the ASCC. The contributors included three economists, three think tank associates, one social scientist from the university, one ambassador, one law professor, two natural scientists, three social entrepreneurs. One gets the impression from reading the book that the social culture really meant social economic, which fits the domains of livelihood, social welfare, and development gap in the SCC blueprint. While admittedly culture has wide meanings, the absence of cultural producers in this book is symptomatic of the malaise. One may think that this is merely a scholarly aberration in ASEAN studies, but the same exclusion of the cultural can be seen on the pages of the anthology, The Third ASEAN Reader. This reader, which includes a wide range of topics and authors, also failed to give us in ours and literature and culture even a token presence. Even articles focused on the ASCC tends to talk more on areas such as environment, migration, and disaster management. While these instances may be interpreted as editorial and authorial prerogatives and idiosyncrasies, they altogether create a discursive formation that excludes the cultural. And it one could argue at this point that those who speak for us and continue continue to talk about the cultural without seriously including voices from the field of cultural production itself. Thus, marginalization in the ASCC comes in two ways. 
One is conceptual, the other is representational. The organ calls itself social culture when most of its domains actually focus on the socioeconomic, such as livelihood, development gaps, social welfare, and environment. Moreover, the discourse of the social cultural is predominantly economistic, if not social scientific. This conceptualization of the cultural, which marginalizes culture, is really somewhat dated. The trajectory of international politics is clearly a movement towards greater sensitivity to cultural rights and greater appreciation of cultures. The second mode, which is representational marginalization, logically follows from the above mentioned discursive narrowness. Because of the discursive limitation of sociocultural, people from the cultural field are logically not included and their views are thus excluded as a matter of course. This marginalization of culture is short-sighted at the very least. It runs counter to the emphasis on identity construction in the Charter. Preamble, Article 114 of Chapter 1, and a chapter titled Identity and Symbols, devote space to identity construction, the development of a conscious of consciousness of belonging to a single region, could ultimately be achieved by the circulation of shared cultural forms and artifacts. If one is seriously looking for the soft side of integration, it exists in the cultural products that can be shared with one another. This was already persuasively argued by Anderson in his study of Southeast Asia novels. The world of fiction allows people living in various parts of a territory to recognize, imagine a community even without meeting each other. Arguably, narratives are stronger are stronger bonds among human beings. If ASEAN really intends to construct a unified region, it must draw lessons from scholars of culture who have shown that the nation state became legible in the world of the novel. Indeed, com communities are unified by the Homer and Shakespeare. Peoples of Southeast Asia will not gather and listen to the songs of the think tanks. My bet is that they will ultimately prefer the Wayang Kuli. This shared taste might in the long run unite them. This last section of my lecture, I offer another trope that would be used to increase our participation in regional construction. Asin was recently described as a work in progress. His description appears to the reader merely as an ordinary and factual statement. Behind its apparent ordinariness and facticity, however, is a literary figuration that has become familiar, the unfinished work. The metaphor used here is work, an object or artifact which is shaped and transformed by human labor. This is one of those instances where the figurative has become part of ordinary language and is no longer appear metaphorical. Here, I shall try to recover the work's earlier figurative sense of being an object of our creative powers and use it as a new description for the international organization that the region is trying to construct. If ASEAN's fiction of community is inadequate, if ASEAN's fiction of community is inadequate, then maybe as a community we could find other metaphors for it to widen our visions. I shall not suggest that we drop the community trope. What we might do is to add another metaphorical dimension as we could reimagine community building as a work and to which we could lay our uh, work against. Perhaps it may help if we imagine this community's collective work of peoples living in a particular space. Critical to this conceptual strategy is Henry Lefebvre's idea of the right to the city, in which he envisioned the city as a collective work of its inhabitants. There are two critical concepts here, right and city. Right for Lefebvre is not a juridical right that is enumerated in constitutions and treaties. Rather, it is one that is rooted in the constituent power of the people who build the city. In this sense, right is prefigurative of future juridical rights. City for Lafab is conceptual as a space, is both inhabited and constructed. Thus, the right to the city means that interested persons have a permanent participation in the collective ownership and management of the space they inhabit. This participation is operationalized in the appropriation of space in the city by its inhabitants. Thus, applying Lafab's concept of regional construction, the inhabitants of the regional space must reclaim a radical right 
to the region. They cannot stand as a passive object of construction by state functionaries with their think tanks, in claiming a right to the region, the inhabitants of the peoples, those who are uninvited to govern, acquire permanent participation in shaping this work that is a community or a region. They therefore appropriate the projects their own, wresting it from the elite, becoming active subjects in the production, appropriation, and management of the region. Through this permanent participation of the interested parties, the regional community, including the international organization, is transformed into a collective work. Thus, the reconceptualization of communities of work entails a conceptualization of the right to the region to be exercised by the inhabitants. Rights thus play a critical role in the formation of both the subject and the object. This interplay between subject, right, and object is constitutive of a more democratic community, the real community. As Raymond Williams once argued, community only became a reality when economic and political rights were fought for and partially gained. There's more community in the modern village as a result of this process of new legal and democratic rights. In other words, we make communities in the process of claiming the right to permanently participate in the construction of a space that we inhabit. Perhaps it would not look too ambitious and presumptuous to begin the exercise of the right by of this right by interrogating ASEAN's fictions of community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Attorney Bagulaya, for your extensive discussion on how to have a new way of seeing ASEAN and the region by connecting the trope of work to the concept of the right of the region and thus allowing a wider and permanent participation of Southeast Asian peoples in building their regional community. May I now call in Attorney Bagares, our reactor, to impart his insights. Good afternoon, thank you for um, having me here. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be called to respond to a, an excellent lecture by my good friend, uh, Duke Bagulaya. Uh, we go a long way. We've um, litigated together as uh, co-counsels in some cases before the Supreme Court. And uh, I have actually read the manuscript uh, of the book of which uh, this lecture is part. And um, to begin, uh, 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 may I ask the organizers to show my first slide? So I'm... We're looking here at the concept of ASEAN as an international community. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I, I see in, uh, in Duke's uh, lecture and a concern about how the question of uh, an international legal person uh, in international is deployed uh, for ASEAN and uh, how uh, they're actually, uh, a, how should I put it? There, 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 there's actually a fictive movement in such a construction of the ASEAN as a community. So there's a fiction of personality as well as a fiction of community according to Duke. And I take this uh, notion of fiction, uh, not just in the, in the sense in which lawyers understand uh, fiction, that this uh, notion of a legal fiction, uh, but more than that, uh, when he speaks of fiction, he's actually uh, talking about uh, certain realities that are hidden uh, behind appearances. And, and, the, and, and, and these hidden things are what should worry us because they, they, had, uh, they actually hide uh, ugly realities. And so um, when he when he says that it's it's not you know it, not in the sense of in, not just mere inventions, but devices that are deployed um, to actually paper over um, what, according to him, amounts to deep injustices. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, for instance, uh, when he talks about uh, fictions of community in ASEAN, he argues that. Here we have a person confirmed uh, or given a uh, will separate and distinct from that of member states, meaning the members of ASEAN. Uh, and uh, there's also a discussion of community that it's not just limited to states, but supposedly this community 
uh, which is also embodied in the will of this person, uh, involves peoples of uh, these member states. So you have uh, a conferral of legal personality and community uh, on ASEAN. And supposedly, uh, the promise is that this legal personality and this community represents the interest of people. Next slide. Uh, but as, he, as uh, Luke shows, um, in the constitutive uh, documents of ASEAN, uh, what you actually see uh, is a reification and the eclipse of the very peoples that are supposed to be represented in ASEAN. So uh, in his paper and in his book, uh, actually from which this article was drawn, um, he painstakingly analyzes, he provides empirical examples of how the ASEAN's uh, official organs are presented as an expression of the will of ASEAN people. But at the same time, you see uh, in such a presentation, in fact, a conflation of international legal person and international community. Of course, we're familiar with the phrase international community. Um, it's often in invoked for many, many, many reasons. Uh, in news media, uh, international community or the concept of an international community is invoked as you know, a reason for humanitarian inter intervention. International community as a reason for all of us to be concerned about certain things. Uh, but uh, here in the, in the example of the ASEAN, uh, in its organs, uh, notably the ASEAN economic community, the social cultural community, and the political security community that are constituted by the A A ASEAN charter, you actually have organs that have become organs of political control. And more than that, they also reflect, they also embody, they also advance uh, what Duke calls the spectral presence of capital and uh, which results in the marginalization of culture. So on the one hand, uh, the document, the founding documents of ASEAN as a community talk about people, the ASEAN people, but in effect, the, the peoples are eclipsed, they are erased because the peoples are replaced by organs that make decisions for them. And these organs uh, are often exclusionary in their practices. And uh, I must take note that in, in, in uh, legal scholarship, peoples have a distinct meaning. The, the notion of peoples have a central place in the decolonizing movement uh, in the 60s, which is the after World War II. Uh, and it's closely related, for instance, to uh, the sense of failure uh, that was met uh, when the, the founding document of uh, the UN Human Rights System, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was first drafted. Uh, and a lot of people uh, from states that were had been colonized uh, felt uh, that uh, the UDHR, despite its promises, was a failure, uh, mainly because the, the imperial states did not want to move beyond uh, the promise of the document. They, they, they were concerned uh, that human rights would be used to decolonize states, which they did not want. But, but the notion of people is crucial for, uh, for, for these uh, groups, these movements that wanted to acquire self-determination. And you can see that, for, instance, for example, in the independent Bandung conference that was uh, created precisely to push against uh, the continuation of uh, the imperial project of all these Western states. So in, in the ASEAN, Duke says, well, if you look at the documents, it talks about peoples, but you don't see peoples being involved in the decision-making process of, uh, the, of the ASEAN as a community. And uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, uh, when you talk, therefore, about uh, international I, I know three problems. The first one is the problem of composition. What do we actually mean when we talk about an international community and specific to ASEAN? As I said earlier, uh, the peoples have been erased. They have been replaced by the will of the state. And then these states hide behind the fiction of the ASEAN as a community. Now we have this um, Article 48 of uh, this Article of State Responsibility. It talks about the notion of uh, uh, certain obligations owed to the international community as a whole. And in the last 20 years or so, legal scholars have been asking the question, what do we mean when you talk about the international community, because before that was understood to be a per, uh, an exclusive uh, playing ground of state. It's just states and that, not, nothing more. Uh, 
reflective of the classical orientation of international law. Uh, but one of the foremost uh, publicists or expert uh, on state responsibility, James Crawford, who just passed on a few months ago, uh, uh, former uh, judge of the International Court of Justice before, uh, uh, said that uh, in his commentaries to the articles, the international community includes entities in addition to state. But the examples he, he gives actually uh, consist of international organizations like the European Union, the international community, except maybe for the ICRC, which is an international uh, humanitarian organization. Uh, the examples he gives of entities that are embraced by the term international community refers to international organizations. As, and as you know, ASEAN is an international organization according to its uh, constituent instruments. So, so we are asked, therefore, what do we mean? What, what, what make up the international community? The second problem, next slide, please, is uh, that uh, uh, is that over time, scholars have also said that we, well, we have to now uh, erase this distinction between subject and object, you know? uh, because in classical international, the only states are subjects, the rest are objects. I think that does not even require for many of us an explanation. Uh, one of the leading scholars of this um, shift of this proposal. Should I uh, go back to my earlier slide? So I continue now. So I was, I was saying uh, Higgins and, and uh, several other scholars uh, stop, now talk about participants in the international legal system. And these participants are no longer limited to state, but they include individuals, they include NGOs, they include other non-state entities. The question then uh, comes to us, uh, assuming these diverse ontologies of participants do exist in the international order, who decides what? Are we going to say that it is still really uh, the states who will uh, be the principal decision maker, even if we already have these uh, uh, non-state entities recognized as having some, in some way, uh, a distinct uh, ontology in international law. Next slide, please. We then uh, come across the problem of structure. Uh, next slide, please. And here, uh, Duke uh, has a spot on critique. He's actually uh, showing that all of these uh, moves of the ASEAN community supposedly in the name of peoples are really uh, just economic code. And these goals apparently have uh, achieved a near totalizing status. They, they now overextend into the other spheres in, in international society in the ASEAN. And um, more often than not, these economic goals determine almost everything else. Uh, and as we know in international law, when we talk about a legal person, if there is an entity that, is, that, that has been given legal personality, then it is also recognized to have rights that allow it to act um, legally in certain ways. And uh, that's the problem uh, according to Duke, because what we have is a community that acts purportedly on behalf of peoples, but, but the reality is not quite uh, uh, correspondent to such a claim of acting, of representing people. And, uh, and there is a, now a tendency really to overextend, really to become totalizing. And, uh, and, and maybe you can also say that if you connect this to the other movements in other places, there's this feeling that international organizations uh, like, for instance, the European Union have actually uh, moved beyond their demos so that uh, constituent peoples and even states feel that uh, they don't no longer want to participate in the discussion because it's not dominated by uh, the international organization. There's also the problem of value. And, uh, and in the ASEAN, what's apparently the primary value is the creation of a neoliberal market. And uh, there's no other value except the market. Because really, originally, ASEAN was envisioned to be an economic market. However, as uh, it has apparently grown beyond that, no, the, beyond, but the, the primary driving force is still economic. Um, and, it, and, and that actually uh, exists happily side by side with its principle of non-intervention. And now uh, that principle, that value of the intervention is being pushed to the limits because of current geopolitical reality. For instance, of course, the South China Sea 
And we, we, re we now realize that if we're going to stick to this principle, then uh, we have this behemoth called China who would, be, who would uh, in due time swallow up the region, uh, being one of now one of the world's uh, biggest economic and military power. And then there's also the question of Myanmar, a genocide. Uh, the, the values that shape ASEAN, uh, they are being tested uh, and they are being found uh, to be wanting. And uh, last, uh, last slide, uh, which leads us now to the last question. Uh, what is true community? Uh, can you please uh, show the slide, uh, the last slide? Um, I'm showing now a, the frontispiece to uh, Thomas Havda Leviathan. This was the, I think the opening page to the book, uh, the first edition of the book, uh, The Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Yeah. And, um, and in this picture, uh, you will actually see uh, a giant king, as it were, holding a scepter and a sword. And his body is uh, illustrated as constituting um, uh, different uh, entities, uh, peoples, churches, uh, government, uh, to, to tell us, to give us the idea that you have this sovereign entity and everything is absorbed into his body. Uh, meaning that uh, there is, a, in fact, uh, no distinction between the body of the sovereign and the body of uh, societies, of entities, of non-state actors, of individuals who are part of, uh, of that sovereign, sovereign territory. And uh, that raises the question, is that what we mean by community? Because often uh, than not, more often than not, uh, that is really at the backdrop of people, of legal scholars, when we talk about community, they want they want a system where uh, states somehow uh, uh, follow a, a certain logic. But the question is, is that really a desirable situation? On the other hand, there's also the, uh, the problem where states are you know, uh, allowed to just do their own thing. What happens to public accountability? And, 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 and I will end uh, therefore my reaction to, to Duke with a question. Uh, what, the, we have this, uh, uh, extreme swings of the pendulum. Uh, is there a happy compromise to that? What kind of structure, what kind of composition do we need? What kind of value system do we need to have a community that respects all of these elements? And on that note, I would like to end my response and I would like to congratulate Duke for a, a, a very substantive and, a, and in fact, a very pioneering lecture as far as I know uh, in the Philippines. And even in the Athens, uh, the book that he has written is the first of uh, its nature. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. All right, thank you very much for your response, Attorney Bagares, for clarifying for us point by point in enriching us, Attorney Bagulayas already comprehensive discussion of his problematic on two fictions involving the problematic trope in the legal person in the ASEAN, a fiction of personality and a fiction of community. Um, Attorney Bagulaya, would you like to share your thoughts regarding uh, Attorney Bagaris' response? As you can see, he ended his, uh, his reaction with a question. Thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Romel. Um, we were discussing this um, concept of community and um, in, in, in my lecture, I think um, Romel um, already mentioned it, that in, um, I, uh, I focus on the idea of fictions in the sense it's both like legal at the same time, something like a rhetorical practice. So when, when we talk about the, the concept of fiction in this um, um, lecture, um, we are actually talking about fiction as what you have in law, like there's a fiction of a person and there's a fiction of community. So I emphasize this and uh, Romel also pointed it out. I emphasize this because that is really how the legal view it's a legal view of ASEAN. And that's something different from other 
um, views, like when you talk about ASEAN from the perspective of political science, they don't usually um, read ASEAN in that way. But if, if you want a legal view of ASEAN, then you have to go into that fiction of the international organization. And so both of us actually emphasize here the, the fiction of law, because law creates a fic fiction of personality it treats you like you are a person that 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 organization is an individual legal person that can sue that has legal standing that's really what is meant here by by the fiction of personality but what is new about asean and in the law of international organization is actually the creation of that fiction of community so that, that is really something unique also in international organizations law. So in international organizations law, you have the fiction of personality at the same time, the fiction of personal uh, community. But as Rommel has already emphasized also, which is actually um, a bit of a clarification to my lecture, that this is not just about legal um, fiction. This is also about um, rhetorical practice. So it, it, it goes beyond legal um, fictions because in, in rhetorical practice, that is actually a way of governing in a way that it hides the exclusions in the process of this form of governance. So community in this sense becomes a tool for exclusions of the people. And so the um, Rommel is also um, very much critical about community. So that's the reason why he raises questions about community. And I, I am quite challenged by that question of whether we would still maintain community or not. <clears throat> I think in my, in my lecture and in my paper, I have not totally decided to throw away community, the concept of community. The reason is this, <clears throat> in international law, in the past, it has always been the interest of the state. That means the interest of that um, original legal person, which was the state. Because international organizations, by the way, they came after the states. So in the past, only states were recognized as persons. Then later on, international organizations were also recognized as international persons. So the recognition of international organization as person, it came later after the, after the state. So in the, if you study international, then most of the time it's really the interest of the state. So, in the history of, of this international discourse, community, the concept of community becomes a kind of limitation to that interest of the state. So that is also the reason why I do not necessarily throw away that concept because most of the treaties, conventions that um, we have like um, the law of the sea, the law of outer space, they actually, according to international lawyers, they actually contain the, um, provisions there that adopt the interest of community or community interests. So community interest, therefore, has been legally adopted. So if you totally reject the idea of community, you might just end up with the selfish notion of you know national interest and you know if we go back to that kind of selfish notion of national interest of the state then it is actually our disadvantage especially for smaller states like you know the philippines and in southeast asia so it's not necessarily our advantageous to us to reject the concept of community 
community interest. So that's that's the reason why I also have to to limit the con the the rejection of community. So what I think is um, important is continuing interrogation of that concept of community, not necessarily we, we throw that away because community interests are now part of international law. And for one reason or another, they are actually useful to us. Okay, like I'll just cite an instance of community interests like the concept of the high seas in um, concept of the high seas in the law of the sea. You know, the, the concept of the high seas, no one can own the high seas. No one can make and transform the high sea into a national territory. And every state has an interest, a community interest in maintaining that that continues to be high seas, not a particular state's territorial sea. That's, that's a concept of, um, of community interest. All states, even if you're far from it, you have an interest to maintain that kind of um, order. So that is um, the usefulness, I think, to be fair about the concept of community that can also be used by smaller states like the Philippines or many other states in Southeast Asia. But I just would like to emphasize again that um, as based on our previous discussions, um, the, the, the concept of rights and work, these are really um, concepts that relate to the position of people, the perspective of people, okay? And because it is giving right to the people to participate and to consider the region as something that is their work, then you actually empower them, you give them, you make them as a subject in this process of region building. So that is, I think, what is important in my own proposition here in this lecture. So as I've said, my, my position, of course, is we can't just throw away community, but at the same time, we have to continuously interrogate it so that it's not used against us. It's not used to hide exclusionary policies. So <clears throat> I think that's all. That's um, thank you so much. Thank you, Romel, for your time and for your insights into my lecture. That's, that's right. Good. Okay. Thank you very much for your clarification. Novel insights and a few brilliant exchange regarding these two, uh, two uh, twin fictions of community and of personality that goes beyond legal practice because it is rhetoric practice as well. So uh, we now come to the open forum so as to engage our audience into this conversation regarding a science fiction of community. Um, please be reminded to, uh, to key in your questions or remarks at the comments section. Now let's have questions coming from the audience. All right, so here is one question from an undergraduate student. Um, historically, how did the trope of community become the language of the state? Is this part of the legacy of the enlightenment conceptualization of the nation state? Well, um, the, the, the concept of community, the one that I'm talking about can be traced actually to the dissolution of the, the socialist world, okay? Because in the past, during that time, socialism was like the new kind of community. It was the community of the future. And then when it became, it, when it dissolved, then there was a search again for another form of community. And then suddenly you have this um, community became the, the language of states and governments. So that in the absence of an ideal community, the, the states just took on that kind of um, rhetoric. And so 
that's the reason why it's now there. So the use of community, at least in this context, in the ASEAN context, it's really a post, post-communist, that's a, the post-Soviet um, effect of the dissolution of socialism in the late 20th century. Uh, that's, that's, thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm, Romel may have um, a different um, answer if, to if, that. I'll just add to that. Uh, historical roots, perhaps, uh, the earlier international act we talked about uh, a family of nations, and then there's a limitation, there's a requirement that to become part of the family of nations, you have to be civilized. And of course, to be civilized meant that you have to be a Western state. And in fact, that was the problem for the Philippines, the, you know, when we had we declared our independence from Spain, and then uh, we were sold by Spain to the Americans for $20 million. We were ignored. Even if we knew international law and our, our representatives argued in Europe, they argued in the US, they sent representatives. Uh, Agoncini was sent to, to argue for the Philippines. But the international before uh, talked about uh, the idea that you have to be civilized, but Filipinos are not civilized according to, to the Westerners, even if uh, we were in, under Spain for 300 years and we learned so many of these so-called Western values. Uh, and and, and, and that, that's, that is really the sad history to the, to the notion of community under the old, uh, the classical uh, international model. You know, so Jup is correct that after World War II, there's an expansion of the notion. And then gradually that notion of civilization has been replaced. Even if formally it's still there, if you look at the char charter of the International Court of Justice on the sources of law, it still talks about uh, general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. No, but nobody wants now to talk about that notion of civilized nations for that reason. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, sir, for that clarification. Now, how is the problem of governance as a mode of governing a Saiyan style? implicated in the persistent and historical problem of economic um, inequality and injustice in ASEAN nations. Can you please right. repeat the question? Uh, here's a follow-up question to that. Uh, how is the problem of governance as a mode of governing ASEAN style implicated in the uh, per persistent and historical problem of economic inequality and injustice in ASEAN nations. Well, um, let me just um, say this, that ASEAN actually is, um, um, was established. If you study ASEAN as an organization, it was really established as an anti-communist group, okay? In, yeah. the, in the beginning, it was an anti-communist group because at that time um, you have Vietnam and the whole um, um, Indochina was um, in a revolutionary um, stage. And so there were states like the Philippines, Thailand and um, Indonesia. They, that's the reason why they, they they have this um, ASEAN declaration. It was not uh, um, stated there. So you can see there the history of um, um, ASEAN as something like, you know, reactionary in, in to be, to, to go into that kind of language. It was really, it's a kind of reaction okay, to a revolutionary um, situation in Southeast Asia. So it, they, they bonded together and um, that was how it was formed. So to a certain extent, um, ASEAN has actually played in the continuation of certain uh, modes of governance that continue the poverty. It, it, it is a form of governance that does not solve um, poverty. So. That's, that's how I, I would um, view many of the um, states in, in ASEAN. So <clears throat> the, there is a continuation of that, at mo that kind of um, governing. And 
ASEAN cannot do anything about it. The ASEAN style cannot do anything about it because, as you know, um, each state does not really intervene in the other's um, practices within their territory. So um, each state still um, allowed is allowed to continue the this mode of governing that produces inequality, um, produces violence. Okay, so the, it's it's actually the, the non-intervention of um, ASEAN in, in in this mode of governing. So you might ask the question, why 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 is it ASEAN now trying to do something about um, excluding Myanmar? from its meetings yes well the in the beginning you know they did not exclude myanmar when myanmar was um pushing its own people into the sea they did not do anything but when the military junta took power okay ousted a legitimate government <laughs> suddenly they became they became very anxious because, well, they are thinking, ah, you're going into that kind of, you know, military coup. That's something different. Okay, something different. Because that can also happen to other states. You have a military um, coup in another state and nothing happens. So it's legitimized. It's authorized. Okay, becomes legitimate. So I think my, 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 my own observation is that they start to move against the Myanmar uh, military junta only because it's really something that might affect the states, governments in other ASEAN states. So if it does not really affect their own interest, ah, they don't really try to intervene. But the question of a coup d'etat is really a question of um, survival also for other states. So those governments do not want to tolerate that kind of government. So that's the the reason why I think there is a um, a new approach to Myanmar. Because they have been, you know, that the, previously Myanmar has been doing a lot of things against its own people. So so that the UN even issued a, uh, an order against it. So but this time Myanmar. Um, with Myanmar's military taking over, you have ASEAN excluding it from a meeting. Ah, that's really something new. That's really something new. So that's that's what I I, I see. Anyway, that's right. all. Right, we agree on that, sir. Now, um, just one last question. In Southeast Asia, as it is known today, a reconceptualization of community under ASEAN is a very challenging goal because of its elitism and obvious lack of freedom and democracy in some member countries themselves. Do you have a suggestion as to how such reconceptualization might be possible? Well, the only the only thing about it um, is um, it is really impossible for us to to impose democracy from the outside. You impose democracy from the outside, ah, it's not going to succeed. <laughs> That's a, you can call it people's democracy, but as long as it is an imposition, eventually it will not really succeed. And that's what has um, happened in Afghanistan and even in Eastern Europe. Okay, so you try to have that kind of, um, form of government imposed by from the outside externally that's not really going to succeed so we can still rely on the people and that's the reason why um, my whole argument is um, reliant on that concept of the people of strengthening the, the that concept of the people of, of giving more rights to the people because that is the only way um, a more democratic um, ASEAN could be realized. I think that there's really no other way for that unless the people start acting 
and demanding certain rights and um, doing something about um, demanding. So that, that's really how it's going to be. Let Thanks. me just add to that, uh, Juke. Uh, that's precisely okay. my point about community. That there's no one community, but actually many communities in ASEAN. Uh, and that's really the reality. And uh, second, uh, the problem also with contemporary international liberal uh, approaches to international law is that uh, they talk about democracy and then actually make uh, the use of force as a means of imposing it. Uh, which is uh, ironical to say the least. You know? And that, that is why uh, all these, uh, what we have seen in the last 20 years of international events uh, is precisely the using democracy or the, using humanitarian reasons for interventions in problems in, around the world. And they actually have not uh, led to changes. They've even made a lot of uh, things uh, much worse than they were. And that, that is why I think we should also not um, underestimate peoples in their own region. Uh, so when you talk about the democratization, uh, they will not succeed if they're imposed uh, from outside. But we must not also lose uh, hope in the fact that people, the people themselves will be capable of, of realizing their own conditions and situations. As in fact, we see that happening in Myanmar also without the help of uh, Western states. Uh, they take things uh, according to their own plan, according to, to their own understanding of the situation. And uh, what you can do is actually, of course, provide some uh, hope and encouragement and pressure on the, the, the current uh, military junta in Myanmar. So, so it would require all these multilateral approaches. But uh, the idea of uh, a military intervention should be out of the question for the, for the very reasons that we have cited. Yes. <clears throat> All right, very well said. Again, thank you very much, Attorney uh, Bagulaya and Attorney Bagares for your edifying lectures and for sharing with us your ideas. It is really an honor to have both of you present in one stage or platform for our lecture series as we celebrate the UNITA centenary. Um, okay, um, let's have a musical break before we go to the final part of our program. May I call in Associate Professor uh, Peter Porticos, Faculty Secretary of the UST Conservatory of Music, to introduce our performer. But before that, let's listen to the announcement of the UST Press regarding Attorney Bagulaya's upcoming book. Good afternoon. My name is Marie Ailil Alvarez, and I'm the director of the UST Publishing House. I was invited to give a few words about Attorney Juke Bagulaya's forthcoming book with us. ASEAN is an international organization, international law and region building in Southeast Asia. In the next few minutes, I would like to give a short overview as to what the book is about and why it is such an important work. In doing so, I hope we can all look forward together to the first quarter of 2022 when the book is expected to come out. What is clear from the title alone is that this book offers a critical study on ASEAN as an international organization. It revisits the initial roles of ASEAN as a regional community and explores its trajectories in legal governance, contextualizing its functions and interventions within the international legal system and Philippine society. Some of the essays that comprise this book have previously been published in prestigious law journals. In five chapters, the author offers his perspective on the following topics. New legal scholarship on the ASEAN, a critique of the ASEAN charter and the limitations of its distinct will, a critique of the language of international law in order to displace ASEAN's fictions of community, and concludes with a history of the construction of the international legal subject. Of chief interest is the discussion on the third chapter, first published in the Asian Journal of International Review, published by Cambridge University Press, where the author has demonstrated how a hermeneutic of suspicion operates in his analysis of ASEAN constitutionalization. This leads to a consideration of the metaphor of the Wayang Kulit for the ASEAN and why it is central to the book, therefore becoming the fitting choice for the cover. The author delineates his position in this choice of image quite poetically in a concluding statement regarding the third chapter. Thus, ASEAN has embodied the Wayang Kulit problem 
in the law of international organization. This is the opposite of the Frankenstein problem, which is really a problem of how to control a creature that has gone too independent. In contrast, the chapter has shown how ASEAN member states have tightened control of the international organization like a puppet in the shadow play. The metaphor is even more apt, considering that international organizations have been interpreted as a veiled entity. Thus, the veil and the puppet have been the instruments of the member states in their shows. To understand ASEAN, one must not only be entertained by the appearances, one must see through the veil and stare at the reality behind it. The work is further lauded for both its thematic significance and its meticulous scholarship, with glowing recommendations from eminent figures in politics and international law. Senator Leda de Lima praises the work for its intellectual rigor and survey of the field. Professor Roman Regalado Bagares calls it a pioneering achievement, as it may very well be the first extended treatment of an organization in existence for more than five decades now. And Dr. Melissa Loja describes the work as the first attempt to capture a CNS as an inclusive entity. Now, the work may sound daunting, especially to readers who may not be from the discipline of law or politics, but a source of comfort is found in the execution of the author's prose, which is rightfully described as lucid. The clarity of ideas presented in each chapter complements the organization of arguments. A clear and coherent structure is laid out at the beginning of every essay so that the reader is oriented into anticipating exactly what the author intends to discuss. I would say that one of the many strengths of this book is its readability, perhaps owing to the author's initial intention of producing this work to be a reference for student scholars who wish to specialize in how ASEAN functions as an international organization, at the same time serving as a material that provides a more critical view of the subject without, and these are his words, pretending to be a sort of textbook. And because Attorney Bagulaya is also a professor of comparative literature, his training in critical theory has given his writing a fresh impetus. The book can also be taken as an embodiment of the true spirit of the critical practice, which is not to condemn, but to open up avenues for discourse. He himself says it beautifully. The aim of critical theory is not the production of more books, but human emancipation and equality. In sum, this comprehensive legal analysis of an intergovernmental organization interrogates the very discourse of law, which ultimately becomes the basis for community building and upholding of human rights. As Senator Delima says in her recommendation, seeing the region through the author's legal eyes is an invitation to reimagining and rethinking its governance that is rules-based and humane for the governed. It is our pleasure and honor to publish a writer, a scholar, and a lawyer of this caliber. And we thank Attorney Bagulaya for choosing the USD Publishing House for the seminal work. Please anticipate the release of the book in the first quarter of 2022. And for more of our current releases and other upcoming literary and scholarly titles, please visit the USD Publishing House Facebook page at facebook.com slash USD Publishing House. Thank you very much. Pleasant evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dr. Peter Porticos, pianist and faculty secretary of the USD Conservatory of Music, together with Mr. Randy Hilongo, tenor and coordinator of the Voice and Music Theater Department of the USD Conservatory of Music. We would like to congratulate USD for the centennial anniversary of UNITAS. We will give you three art songs today, namely Andy Music by Franz Schubert, Iyo Kailan Paman by our very own Angel Peña, and Spring Waters by Sergei Rachmaninoff. Spring Waters is our way of wishing UNITAS another hundred years or more.
Again, that was uh, Assistant Professor Randy Gilongo, tenor from the UST Conservatory of Music. Congratulations again to Attorney Bagulaya on your much awaited book titled ASEAN as an International Organization, International Law and Region Building in Southeast Asia. Surely it is a gem in the field of law and literature. And thank you, Sir Duke, for all the brilliant work that you do. Okay, so before we end the program, Please be reminded about answering the post evaluation form that can be accessed through the link posted in the comment section below. Next year, 2022, Uritas Journal will celebrate its centennial anniversary. To commemorate it, a series of activities have been lined up as a gift to the public, especially to the journal's loyal readers among students, scholars, academics and researchers. The opening salvo is another series of lectures billed as the UNITA Scholars International Lecture Series, which will run bi-monthly throughout the first quarter of 2022. In this series, these lectures uh, will be based on the articles published in UNITAS to be delivered by the authors themselves in which the salient points are explicated and elaborated on for and with the audience. In this way, the UNITAS published authors speak directly to the audience via Zoom about their work across platforms. The idea is to bring to life the journal's printed page to a classroom lecture style forum and engage them directly in the world of intellectual and scholarly discovery. Each program will feature a 40 minute lecture followed by a 15 minute Q&A interaction with the audience around questions inspired by the lecture, which may be written in the chat box feature of Zoom to be read out by the MC or asked directly by the audience themselves. In the publicity before the scheduled lecture, a link to the UNITAS published work to be discussed will be provided to the public. This activity will be co-sponsored by the Department of Literature of UST. So uh, the initial lecture is slated for early February to be delivered by Dr. Ekaterina Baklanova of the Institute of Asian and African Studies of Lomonosov Moscow State University, Russian Federation. Her lecture will pick up from her article from a killing to Rosales, Philippine Literary Studies in Russia, which appears in volume 93, number two of the journal. Later in February, the lecture will be delivered by Professor Jose Di Blanco of the University of California in San Diego, and his lecture will be based also on his UNITAS article, A Mexican Princess in the Tagalog Sultan's Court, published in volume 92, number one of the journal. Again, you are all invited to win. 
So at this point, Unitas thanks Attorney Duke S. Bagulaya and Attorney Romel R. Pagares, both exemplars of legal scholarship today that is in conversation with fellow scholars in the country and abroad for their insightful, thought-provoking, and brilliant reflections of today's topic. On this note, Unitas would like to thank the thousands of viewers who have been with us in many of the lectures in this series uh, since June, asking interesting questions, contributing to the discussions with their remarks, or even for just having been there, quietly listening, watching, and picking down notes about the lectures as some of them have indicated to us. Uh, for those who missed certain installments of the series, the lectures are recorded in the FB account of UNITAS. Do check it out. We hope the lecture series was able to showcase the kind of intellectual inquiries uh, UNITAS has been concerned with throughout the 100 years of its publication as we celebrate its centenary. At this historical juncture, an important electoral exercise is slated for next year, and we know that very well. We also hope some of these inquiries have inspired our own reflections about this exercise, which might just prove to be a defining moment in our national and individual lives. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. I would just like to acknowledge our dear Editor-in-Chief and President of CLASS, Professor Maria Luisa Torres Reyes, for taking the lead in the celebration of the UNITAS Centenary and to our dear staff members, Francis, Kim, Nico, and Honey, for all the work that you do. Again, this has been your host, Macy Villa Perez. Thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>